Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second in our series of conversations uh, with legislators about growing North Carolina's clean energy economy. We welcome today three outstanding chambers of commerce representing different areas of the state and three of North Carolina's leading General Assembly members and who are also clean energy champions who hands down get it and are supporting smart economic initiatives and policy to attract economic investment and job creation that clean energy brings. We also welcome all of our attendees, including those who joined us last Friday for our first panel discussion. Today's discussion is the same critical topic but featuring different voices. I'm Susan Monroe and I'm Director of Economic Development with Chambers for Innovation and Clean Energy. I work with and support Chambers of Commerce and economic development leaders in North Carolina to navigate the opportunities for clean energy development in their communities. And there's a lot of exciting opportunities to navigate right now. So I wanna um, just set the stage for um, today's discussion on creating a stronger, cleaner economy. Here's a quick snapshot of where our state is with clean energy. Clean energy accounts for over $28 billion in economic impact in North Carolina. And at the close of 2019, a workforce of 113,000, according to ET Clean Jobs North Carolina report. These jobs are primarily in solar, wind, energy efficiency, grid modernization, energy storage, and clean vehicles. North Carolina has more than 7,300 megawatts in installed renewable energy capacity. Sound impressive? Um, perhaps, but it only accounts for about 10.4% of the state's electricity generation mix. So a lot of potential there. And today with wind and solar now being cost competitive and often cheaper, than other energy generation resources, the job and economic impact numbers that I just reviewed, there's just never been a more critical time to support what could become one of our state's top opportunities for economic growth. Every county in North Carolina is home to clean energy, including our rural areas who have been especially hard hit during the pandemic. We'll hear, we'll hear more about that from one of our legislators today. But here's, but here's a deeper look at the impact. 87% of utility solar project investments were made in tier one and tier two counties in the state. And as these communities are working every day to rebuild their local economy during this overall time of economic uncertainty, these solar projects plus the potential of offshore wind and more onshore wind development these are the opportunities to help us build a stronger and more resilient economy for decades to come. And hey, we have some breaking news today regarding offshore wind in North Carolina. There is now an official offshore wind supply chain registry database for our state. Um, we didn't even have time to prepare a slide for it, but the easiest way to find out more is to go to nccommerce.com and just search for offshore wind supply chain. One more time, go to nccommerce.com and search for offshore, uh, offshore wind supply chain. The database will serve as a platform to promote companies offering or considering offering offshore wind products and services to encourage business partnerships and to provide offshore wind developers and OEMs easy access to our supply chain. So as for offshore wind and all, of, all other renewables in our state, with the right policies and support in place, North Carolina can not, even, can not only lead the Southeast, but perhaps the country in clean energy development. So let's combine that with the potential to rebuild our state's utility business model, which I know one of our legislators has a few things to say about that, to be more competitive and market driven our economic future is looking bright. So as we continue this discussion today, we encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We hope to have time to address some of those following Representative Hanig's remarks. 
So let's start the conversation. Please join me in welcoming Kirk Ballard with the Mooresville South Aradell County Chamber of Commerce. Kirk, thanks for being with us this morning. Take it away. And I would like to remind um, our panelists um, that when it is your turn um, in the agenda to please make sure that you, um, you unmute your vid video and unmute um, your audio. Thanks so much. Welcome, Kirk. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, my name is Kirk Ballard. I'm president of the Mooresville Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mooresville is located in Iredale County. Uh, we're known because we're right in the middle of Lake Norman, right off of 77. A lot of people know us because of NASCAR. There are about 50 NASCAR teams that are right here. Uh, our membership is a little over a thousand at this point. And prior to COVID, we were averaging one new business a day opening in Mooresville. Now people are coming to Mooresville for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the most uh, remarkable is the Mooresville grade school district that started the laptop initiative about 15 years ago. And uh, with that, every child from the third grade on is given a MacBook Pro. That's what they learn on. They don't use textbooks. And it has taken the graduation rate from 65% to 95%. Uh, the last year of uh, Barack Obama's term, he came to Mooresville and said, we wanna make this a model for the country. So businesses, individuals are coming here because education is a prime component for every individual. They wanna make sure their children get the best uh, opportunity available. The other thing is that Mooresville started 20 years ago, the Hydrail Initiative, which is to turn uh, diesel engine passenger trains and using hydrogen uh, fuel cells. Uh, the chamber partnered with App State University and the Charlotte Regional Transportation Organization that has now brought hydrogen rail to 29 countries. And starting this year in San Bernardino, there will be the first hydrogen train in the United States. But also Mooresville is known for uh, the home of Power Home Sol uh, Solar that is right here off of Main Street and Greenworks Tools. Greenworks Tools makes uh, battery operated landscaping equipment and it's just looking at alternatives to gasoline engines and this kind of thing is happening right here in Mooresville. One of the great supporters of that is one of our first speakers who is also a member of the Mooresville Chamber of Commerce. So I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker today, Senator Vicki Sawyer, who will be returning for her second elected term to North Carolina How uh, Senate representing District 34 in the western part of the state. She's already been an integral part of the fight for free market policies in the General Assembly and was recently honored as the 2020 North Carolina Clean Energy Champion Award recipient. Uh, join me in welcoming Senator Vicki Sawyer. We are so pleased to have you join us. Hey, Kirk, I am awaiting ability to turn on my camera as host, but thank you as always for that wonderful uh, message and introduction. And I, I, it seems like I see you more on video now than I do in person. <laughs> it's a new world. It's a new world. Hopefully we'll get that to change. So thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, is everyone, oh, I see my video is now on, so thank you. Um, so I'm very honored to have been selected as a clean energy champion. And quite frankly, when I started out as a legislator, I did not know uh, the intricacies of the uh, energy game. But as Kirk mentioned, we have some valuable um, partners in our community that are uh, clean energy folks, as well as to the south of us, we have Train. And another one is Bank of America that has um, recently or um, said that they were going to try to be 100% carbon neutral. Uh, as someone who's recycled her whole life and a native North Carolinian, I, I do value the environment and I also value choices. So when I say I started out not really understanding uh, three years ago about energy, I got a, uh, a washed in a lot of information because of a local issue. And I will say it's become one of my favorite uh, topics is energy and how that is, because it's one thing that affects our daily lives and one thing that we need more and more of. 
So with any policy decision, I always look at how can we increase consumer choices and how can we increase market competition? And clean energy is doing just that for North Carolinians. And I'm very supportive of their initiative as we move forward. I was happy to see that the Utilities Commission just allowed some more um, EV parking and, and uh, things so that they can, um, folks who buy electric vehicles will be able to have a lot more uh, options in order to charge those. I myself wanted a Tesla and I chose not to get it because I was afraid that there wouldn't be a place between here and Raleigh when I was campaigning. So I'm happy to see that that's a, a common sense everyday solution that's, that's moving forward. And there are businesses that we have that continue to uh, make their carbon footprint energy neutral and definitely are supporting those and glad to be there. Um, some may say that uh, clean energy is not a very Republican idea or that it's not, or somehow politicize it. But for me, clean energy doesn't have to be a party. It is actually a good policy and something that we all need to continue because as we can need to have more and more needs of energy and quite frankly, in COVID, the delivery method is a lot different now since we're not all working in these hubs, we're working at home. There has to be progressive, innovative solutions to tomorrow's problems. And that is why I've been very supportive of the industry. Um, definitely increasing choice, increasing consumer options, environmental friendliness, and also for our rural communities. It seems like in Raleigh, we talk so much about the infrastructure in and outside of our top tier counties. And those tier counties need our support for those of us who live in uh, the metropolitan areas. And one of that is through energy consumption. And we do have folks out in the Northeast North Carolina that have really been a champion with wind and solar and delivery. So we're excited to continue policy um, that will help with our rural communities, um, help those folks uh, get an economic advantage over um, using their natural resources and using those natural resources wisely. So again, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, the honor of being a clean energy champion and also for me being a panelist today. And I really look forward to seeing what everyone else has to say. Thank you so much. Well, um, thank you. Thank you, Senator. That was some amazing comments and you're right on the money uh, regarding um, uh, your, your thoughts on free market competition with, with energy and the opportunity for our rural communities to, to really take advantage of, of their natural resources. So thank you. Um, our next chamber executive, um, I had the privilege to work with her recently on filming a video about the economic growth that utility solar can bring to our state. And she's located not that far from me. And I am so happy to introduce Dana Wooten of the Clayton Chamber of Commerce. Dana, welcome. Thanks, Susan. I appreciate it. And it was a pleasure getting to work with you and, and getting to know you a little bit, bit better. Um, as Susan said, I'm President and CEO of the Clayton Chamber of Commerce. I've been here for the past four years. And for those of you who do not know, Clayton uh, is located in Johnston County and Johnston County borders Wake County. Um, so we um, uh, sit right outside of Wake County and the capital of Raleigh. Um, our chamber has uh, 450 members at this time. We're one of uh, four chambers in this county. And um, I've been um, so happy to be at in one of the fastest growing counties in North Carolina. And Clayton is one of the fastest growing um, towns within Johnston County. So um, I'm thrilled to be a part of, of that uh, process. And so Clayton is also home to the uh, Research Triangle Zone. And that is where um, a lot of the major industries in uh, Johnston County reside, uh, one being um, Caterpillar, uh, which, uh, you know, is a uh, manufacturing of commercial industrial equipment. Uh, one is Griffles Therapeutics, which is um, plasma manufacturing, and we've just undergone a huge expansion um, with Griffles. Um, and also uh, Novo Nordis, who um, manufacturing, manufactures medicines for diabetes, uh, rare blood disorders, obesity, 
um, and things like that. And Novo Nordisk has just invested um, a significant amount of money um, in the so in solar energy and um, just wanted to mention that Johnston County is home to 22 solar projects, which I'm sure Representative Strickland will touch on in um, his talk. Um, so just wanted to say that the Clayton Chamber and the town of Clayton are thrilled to be involved in upcoming opportunities to attract more um, clean energy investment to this area. So as Susan mentioned, um, we were um, invited and excited to participate in a video showcasing how um, solar energy is growing our local and state economy. And so I think at this time, Susan is going to play this video. Do I need to uh, stop my video and mute myself in order for this to happen? Yep, go ahead and do that. Okay. We grow you know, cotton for the most part, some soybeans. My name is Ken Gaganis. You know, my family and I operate a small uh, row crop farm in Martin County. In April of 2013, uh, my wife and I received a letter in the mail from Ecoplexus. I gave its due diligence and you know, threw it in the trash. The next day, I was at uh, my kitchen sink, you know, washing dishes, and that letter was laying on top of the trash pile. And I said, "Well, what will it hurt, you know, for us to, you know, inquire about, you know, this offer?" And as they say, the rest is history. This was totally, you know, new for us. Uh, they offered, you know, financial stability that we were not able to provide for ourselves, you know, in the row crop, you know, farming sector. We still want to provide uh, college education opportunities for our, ch our children. But without having a pension plan or a retirement opportunity, uh, the solar industry figured into the decision to make solar a part of our family. That's only just a small portion of what uh, Blessing Solar has provided, you know, a career, you know, for my two boys. Our two sons formed their own LLC, you know, providing solar maintenance. The finished product and the end result you know, has been a great blessing for our family. The solar farms produce a much higher income per acre than rural agricultural land. I'm Larry Strickland. I'm a North Carolina state legislator. I'm a fourth generation owner of a family farm. In Johnston County, we have 22 solar farms that bring in income of roughly $425,000. And that same acreage in the past brought in roughly $25,000. And that within itself is a 1,900% increase we're always looking for additional revenue to build schools, to help pay teacher salaries, police. I certainly understand and appreciate solar energy and economic growth and job creation that is created here in Johnston County. I hear the pros and cons daily about solar versus farmland. Once you start building subdivisions on farming land, it never returns back. A solar farm, you'll have the option of dismantling that solar farm and its panels and returning it to a farm use to pass it on to your heirs, your next generation. I can't seem to get my microphone, I mean my video on, but I will take this opportunity now to um, introduce Representative Strickland, who was featured in this video. Um, he is a clean energy champion um, for Johnston County, who has served two terms in the state house and will return for a third term in January. He's a real estate appraiser and farm 
farmer representing Johnston and Harnett counties. Um, in his short time so far in the General Assembly, he has proven to be a great champion for North Carolina's electricity customers. So I'm pleased to introduce Representative Strickland, whom I've known quite a few years. It's great to see you this morning, and I want to thank you for your time today and to share your thoughts on growing North Carolina's economy and clean energy. So I'll turn it over to you now, Representative Strickland. Thank you, Dana. It's always a pleasure to uh, be talking to you and you do a tremendous job for Johnston County and uh, all you do for the town of Clayton. Uh, my name's Larry Strickland. I am a native lifelong resident of Johnston County, grew up on a tobacco farm in Eastern Johnston County and have seen a tremendous amount of change in Johnston County during my lifetime. I'm 65 years old. I'm a baby boomer. And uh, that farm I grew on, grew up on, I still own. So uh, we're in our fourth generation, at least possibly could be the fifth generation. <clears throat> I am a former member of the Johnston County Board of Education. I served on that board for 18 years. And the last eight years as its chairman before I uh, took the oath to, to go to Raleigh. Uh, 19, uh, well, 2000 since, 2010 census probably will indicate a population of Johnston County of about 160,000. Uh, the upcoming census, we will exceed 200,000, could be about 230,000. During my 18 years on the Johnston County Board of Education, we built 25 schools. The challenge we have in Johnston County is tremendous growth, baby boomers that own family farms that are absentee owners and come to an age of deciding what to do with that farm. And we're seeing challenges of either a family trying to hold on to that farm and pay its taxes or sell it to developers. And the western quarter of Johnston County that is adjacent to Wake County, as Dana has mentioned, there is tremendous growth and it's coming east. My district is parallel of I-95. It runs north and south from the Wilson County line down to the uh, Harnett County line and goes up to I-40 up to the community of Cleveland. So therefore, um, we in my district right now, it's very rural. It is changing. A lot of farms, a lot of agriculture is still the number one industry, uh, industry in our county. And uh, we have 22 uh, solar farms, as was mentioned in the video. And used to those uh, compi uh, comprised 22 solar farms brought in a, a tax uh, income of roughly $21,000. And now it brings in a, a, in excess of $427,000 of property tax per year. And that is a 1,923% increase. So it, what we're able to do with so, solar farms is a farmer, as Mr. Fergain has mentioned in the video, can go on their farm and, and slice out a, a portion of acreage and get a sizable income from that solar farm that in essence helps save that farm for the next generation, helps pay property tax. And it's a diverse income for that farmer when times are uh, challenging, whether it's a potential bad weather, a drop in commodity prices, uh, the, the market changes. So, it produces a, a financial opportunity for that farmer to lease part of that farm uh, into a solar farm. Um, we have uh, a lot of challenges as far as uh, what the future will be in Johnston County with the growth. And it's my hope that uh, as we educate more and more of our farming community, that this is an option that we can hang on to our agricultural land in Johnston County and, and provide it 
give an opportunity for the next generation to be able to inherit that farm. Eastern North Carolina is changing also. Uh, it's more agricultural inclined. It has more farming uh, as far as the economy, but uh, those challenges in Wayne County and Sampson County and Jupiter County, at some point in the near future, they're gonna meet the challenge, challenges that we have in Johnston County. And uh, I just, I see this as a very a viable opportunity for the farming community, uh, having been on a farm, having on a farm, uh, it, it is a potential income producing uh, scenario for a, a farm farmer. And that's why I embrace this concept and uh, look so much forward to trying to help educate our, our farmers, uh, not only in Johnston County, but down east in, in Eastern North Carolina. Uh, I, I do think that uh, we ha we've got a lot of challenges with our competition in North Carolina when it comes to energy and market reform and market access and competition and trying to just change the, the ongoing current monopoly that we've got uh, in North Carolina where we need to, in my opinion, need to open the market, have uh, better and cheaper results. And uh, the last session I introduced uh, HB, HB 958, which uh, is a energy reform uh, bill and it, more or less bottom line is it would uh, open up a study commission uh, with looking at electric rates here in North Carolina and uh, trying to look at the bottom line of wholesale energy prices. It's been said that uh, if we had a competitive southern, Southeastern RTO, uh, the cumulative savings would be roughly $384 billion by 2040 as, the, as compared to doing nothing. So uh, I have been working with Senator Tom Davis from South Carolina. He sponsored South Carolina H4940. And uh, that is, uh, had, has been passed in the state of South Carolina and they've got a steady commission that uh, is uh, formed and we'll be reporting back to that legislation uh, uh, down in South Carolina. So uh, I, I'm a true champion of uh, clean energy and I, I do think that uh, we need to explore the, what we can do as legislators in the General Assembly of North Carolina to look at uh, how we can Elect electricity reform and work for the wholesaler, uh, wholesale energy prices, lowering them for our cons uh, customers throughout uh, North Carolina, whether they live on a family farm, whether they own a business, we need to be more competitive and uh, especially in the times that we live right now, uh, it's very challenging. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, uh, look forward to the future discussion. Representative Strickland, thank you um, so much. And um, I, your work on energy market reform is, is quite um, important and critical for our state and for our attendees today, um, especially our cha chambers of commerce and, and economic development leaders who, who are leading their communities and are the voice of business, this is something for them that they certainly need to keep informed about because it's, it's a true and significant impact to their chamber members' bottom line. Uh, so, so thank you. Um, thank you for taking the lead in that. And yes, you are indeed one of our state's um, greatest clean energy champions. So um, next, I am happy to introduce a chamber colleague of mine, uh, Josh Bass from the Curatuck uh, Chamber. 
um, of Commerce, and he also is a clean energy champion. Uh, a couple of years ago, he was distinguished with that honor, and I'm so happy he can be with us today. Josh, thank you. Well, thank you, Susan, and thank you for having us and, and hosting this important forum today on clean energy. I think we're getting a lot of new information. We all appreciate that. Um, so the Curry Tech Chamber, I am with the Curry Tech Chamber, and we are located right in the northeastern corner of North Carolina. We border the state of Virginia and the Atlantic Ocean. We uh, have four solar farms right now, or three that are currently uh, operating. One that has just started uh, putting its permits and about to start construction. We're close to Amazon Wind Farm um, to our west. It's over in Passportain County and Performance County in the Elizabeth City area. And one exciting opportunity for us is really the um, advance of offshore wind. Uh, there's a project that's going off the coast of Norfolk and Virginia Beach that Dominion Energy, um, our major utility here, is going to do in the Virginia waterways. And then Avangrid Renewables is looking over there with Kitty Hawk offshore wind project, which really will go kind of off the coast of the Outer Banks to the Virginia state line. Um, a lot of things around that with supply chains that I'll be happy to talk about later. Um, but huge economic impact in terms of construction jobs and some ongoing jobs, and then really, you know, supply chain um, for some of that, that that we could be looking at. For us, we're certainly not growing at the, the pace that Representative Strickland was talking about in Johnston County. Um, my wife is from uh, the Cleveland community, so I had seen um, the years we've been together how quickly Johnston County's growing, but Curry Tech is growing pretty rapidly. We um, like border Virginia, and if you know the geographics of southeastern Virginia, um, they're a little hemmed in again by the Atlantic Ocean and the Chesapeake Bay. So the only way for the Virginia Beach Norfolk metro area to grow is to kind of grow north, uh, west, and south. So we're starting to get some of that growth with a lot of housing. So one very thing that the solar is allowing us to do: the large solar farm we have is about 1,800 acres of solar. Is we're able to basically land bank that. Um, the solar farm should be operational for about 20, 25 years, my understanding, and then they'll be assessed at that point, see if it makes sense to do solar or makes sense to do something else with it. But again, 20 years out, we expect a lot of growth where that's located. So there may be a higher or best, better use for that land. So we're looking at it in some degree as a way to land bank um, so that these, this acreage we have doesn't just go into housing and that we can do something more unique with it as our uh, county continues to grow. Um, I'm here really to introduce Representative Bobby Hannig. Uh, Representative Hannig, uh, he won this year's North Carolina Clean Energy Champion Rising Star. He uh, brings a wealth of information about clean energy to our region and state and is well-deserving of that award and we're proud to have him. Representative Hannig was recently elected to his second term in the North Carolina House, where he has already emerged as a leader on key issues and was uh, recently, I believe last week, elected uh, Deputy Majority Whip. He represents the coastal counties of District 6 as a local business owner and Army veteran. He's the former chair of the Curry Tuck uh, County Commissioners and vice chair of the Curry Tuck Chamber of Commerce. Representative Hannig, I've always got to throw that into your bio. So welcome to my good friend, Representative Bobby Hannig. And I think he's just getting his uh, audio and video ready. Hello there, everyone. Hello there, everyone. Hey, Josh, Josh, thank you for Hi. the uh, great introduction. Much appreciated. And uh, thank you, Susan, for facilitating this meeting and discussion. I'm super excited to see the innovations and in technology uh, moving so rapidly in the renewable industry. Um, a little different perspective from my end is, um, uh, as, as you all may know, I, I, I really believe that Having all the energy resources available is uh, paramount to maintaining our energy independence and our national security. Um, I would say that uh, the, the advancement that I'm most energized about, pardon the pun, is, is the energy storage. Um, it's gonna be a big factor in the coming years and it's nothing short of remarkable how far we've come in that, in that arena in the technology in such a short period of time. Um, as the other speakers have stated, uh, solar is a fantastic, fantastic option for farmers to use as their farms become less viable. 
Um, this generates financial stability for them and tax revenue for our rural areas. Um, uh, Currituck County just in itself, uh, uh, from before we had renewables, uh, the, that land produced about 10,000 in uh, tax revenue. And uh, this year we're almost up to 500,000. So uh, it, it's a great resource for everyone involved. Um, I really appreciate spending time with you all today. And um, you know, uh, anytime you sit through these, these webinars and meetings, you just learn so much. And you know, I'm, looking, I'm really looking forward to the future of renewable energy um, and its advancements. Um, I believe the role of the General Assembly uh, is to consider legislation that facilitates the advancements of technology and the way that we use such advancements. Uh, one example would be uh, HB 329. Um, I was a primary sponsor on that in 2019. Uh, this bill allows market access to companies that want to install charging stations um, for electric cars uh, at their companies, um, be it uh, a, a rest area or welcome center or a gas station, wherever it may be. Um, so, uh, you know, as we all know, um, increasing accessibility um, broadens the market and increases the demand. Um, so, uh, Senator Sawyer, you can now go buy your Tesla. I think you're going to have a really good network to get to and from in your district. And um, uh, thank you all again for the opportunity to be with you all today. Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. And uh, thank you. is that we have a few minutes to take some questions. And uh, we have one, actually, Representative Hanig, uh, this, one, this one is for you. So you're entering uh, your second term now, I believe, as representative. And the question is, um, how, how have your clean energy views evolved over time? And I will turn that question over to Representative Hainig. Uh, thank you. It, it, it wasn't letting me uh, come back on for right. a second. You hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. You know, it, it's um, uh, as some of you may know uh, when I was a county commissioner, I chaired the board of commissioners, and we had a few issues with 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 solar coming in, and our ordinances weren't up to speed with with what we felt need, would really suit our area and um, so we had put a moratorium on it. And um, what that did was that, that allowed us time to really research and understand what renewables was about. And uh, it really opened my eyes um, as, far, as far as the viability of it and how it helps our county, how it helps our region, how it helps the state. Um, so it's uh, that, that window of time really helped me uh, move along faster than I probably would have had this not arisen. Um, so uh, I think it's a fantastic thing and um, I'm uh, proud proud to uh, help it move along and uh, do what I can to uh, help us get where we need to be. That's great. Um, thank you so much. And once again, if you do have any um, questions, please um, please feel free to go to the Q&A box and enter those. And let's see, um, we have a question for Josh Bass with, um, with the Curatech Chamber. Josh, uh, let's see, let me see if I can read this. Um, the, question, the question I have for you um, is, with, with the upcoming offshore wind development, uh, not only in North Carolina, but in Virginia as well, but for the upcoming, um, upcoming development in North Carolina, how do you view um, or do you have any understanding of um, the relationship, uh, the connection between offshore wind and tourism? I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that tourism makes up a big part of your economy. I'm just interested in your thoughts and comments on that. Thanks. 
Sure, Susan, I'm, I'm happy to take that. I'm not sure if I can get my video up, but I think I've got audio working. Um, yes, you do. But, uh, okay, perfect. Um, but uh, yes, major tourism, uh, I think I turned, I don't, yep, I've got video now. Um, yes, major tourism area, you know, we represent the northern end of the Outer Banks. Um, so a lot of people come from the DC, Philadelphia, Ohio markets here. Um, there's some serious concern on offshore wind initially um, by just the tourism industry, but the fishing industry as well. Um, the tourism industry, of course, had some concerns about site impacts. And if I'm correct, the, the wind turbines that they're going to be building off the coast of um, the Outer Banks are going to be over 20 nautical miles out to sea. So it's my understanding they will be so far out there that you actually start getting the curvature of the earth so that they will be almost impossible to see. Um, plus in the summertime, there's a uh, little hazier just in the atmosphere generally. So if they were visible, it would really be this time of year. Um, and, and, but really we expect zero visual impacts from those because they're gonna be so, so far out. The um, other concern, of course, is the fishing and seafood industry that is a major industry here. Um, they have concerns about what this would do to disrupt some of their traditional fishing grounds um, because it is going to be a large area that has been leased to, uh, for offshore wind. Um, and what we found in some studies, um, of course, a couple of years ago, Block Island became the first operational offshore wind farm off the coast of Rhode Island. Um, and there's been some studies there and I think around the rest of the world that what these uh, wind turbines actually do when they're in the ocean is they create artificial reefs and actually help with some fish stocks and their breeding and actually over time increase fish populations uh, and, and are really a boon to the fishing economy. So really what we see there is going to be all positive. And I think a lot of those fears, you know, anytime you've got some new industry coming in, there's always going to be some fears from existing industries. But I think what the uh, legacy industries have found is really they think that there's going to be a great partnership with offshore uh, wind. The other piece of offshore wind that I'd like to touch on, and I think I touched on a little bit in my welcoming remarks, is the supply chain. There's three major component parts of an offshore uh, wind turbine and I'm going to get I'm going to butcher the term so I'm sure there's people um, on this that know the terms much better than I am but it, essentially there's the post that goes in the water that holds the turbine there's the blades and then there's the motor that turns those are the three major component parts and then there's um, a lot of smaller parts that go into making those what everybody wants right now for offshore wind is to land some of the manufacturing um, that goes into those uh, wind turbines. We have some manufacturers in North Carolina, I know around the Charlotte uh, area, that com manufacture component parts for the on land wind turbines. But really, everybody wants to compete for that major manufacturing piece. In the northeastern part of the state, we're somewhat well positioned for that because we have the port of Norfolk um, that could be the marshalling port for a lot of the East Coast uh, manufacturing. So if, if it ends up being Norfolk is, is marshalling a lot of those component parts. I think you'd see some smaller manufacturers locating around with Eastern North Carolina that service major manufacturers that are going to be located around the port. And I think it's also important to understand with offshore wind that if you've seen the onshore wind turbines, they're large. The offshore wind are far larger. So a lot of those component parts are going to be being moved by barge. So they can't be, but so far inland. Uh, rail and trucking are just going to be difficult for them. So really, you're going to be looking at coastal communities getting this manufacturing. And again, with, with our proximity to Norfolk, Virginia Beach, I think we are in a good place to land some of that for northeastern North Carolina. So Susan, I think that, I hope that answers most of the question, um, but I can certainly follow up on it if any of you would like. Oh, that's great, Josh. Um, and that um, that brings me up to remind um, our viewers for more information about um, offshore wind supply chain or to direct your member businesses um, who may ha have an interest in that, uh, go to nccommerce.com and just enter into the search bar um, offshore wind supply chain and that will take you to where you need to go. Um, just really exciting opportunity for our state um, and a lot of work yet to be done. Um, actually at you know, the, the, 
the state house as well. So um, lots of opportunity there. So we we have um, a, another question and, and this would go and I'd love to hear um, Senator Sawyer's comments on that as well. But but any any of our panelists, your thoughts about what's coming up for 2021 in terms of clean energy policy um, at the state house, um, especially maybe re regarding energy uh, reform uh, in regards to that. So we would love to hear um, any of our panelists comments on that. Uh, this is Representative Strickland. I foresee the uh, next session of the General Assembly when we convene in January. Uh, I, it is my hope and my intention to be a partner of more transparency discussion within the two chambers uh, of the General Assembly regarding clean energy. Uh, it is my intent as a House legislator to reintroduce uh, my House Bill 958 uh, that deals with uh, energy, uh, electricity market reform in North Carolina, known as the RTO. Uh, it is my intention to refile that bill, hopefully have much more discussion than we had in the previous session, but I hope and that I can be a partner of having a more transparent situation uh, in our General Assembly regarding discussions of energy uh, and elect electricity market reform, uh, having a much broader uh, discussion among our legislators, uh, We've been on this uh, journey, I have since uh, 2017, January 2017. And as uh, Senator Sawyer mentioned, uh, we learn so much as we become more uh, seasoned, I guess is the term you could use, legislators. There's just so much knowledge out there embracing the different uh, groups such as the North Carolina Manufacturers Association, the North Carolina Realtors, the North Carolina Chamber of Commerces. Uh, you've got people like Carolina Utility Customers Association being uh, listening and gathering information from, from those stakeholders provides so, so much knowledge for folks like uh, Representative Hainick and myself, and we've got new legislators coming in. So again, it's my hope that we can have a much broader, more transparent discussion about clean energy in North Carolina, how it can help our economy, how it can produce jobs, and just have a much broader discussion when we're discussing our bills uh, <clears throat> that are brought forth in our committee meetings. Thank you. Um, thank you, Representative. And um, I think that is going to wrap up our discussion today. Legislators, thank you. Thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you. Thank you for carving out the time to have this important discussion. Um, I, I know that you have a lot of important issues um, facing you um, in your districts and your state as, as we come out um, on the other end of of the pandemic. I also want to thank the chambers for, for being with us today. Um, and we look forward to, to your leadership in your communities on how we further navigate and take and take advantage of clean energy development in, in our communities. Um, you are welcome to contact me at this information um, that is on your screen. Uh, we invite you to um, continue the discussion on how we can further our, our economic development with clean energy. And thank you also for um, being patient with us as we navigate the wonderful world of Zoom that we're operating in now. We wish you all a very Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, 
happy holidays, stay safe and healthy, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone.